Professor Darren Kandau. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. I want to start today with a series of rapid fire questions. First question is, do our bodies make their own creatine? Yes. In grams, roughly how much creatine is in an average sized adult? About 12 to 20 grams per kilogram of muscle. How much creatine do most people consume each day? One to three gram. Roughly, what are the creatine densities? Let's say grams of creatine per 100 grams of food of some of the higher creatine foods. The, the highest amounts would be in red meat and seafood, about five grams per kilogram of meat. Is dietary creatine fundamentally the same as supplemental creatine monohydrate powder? Regarding monohydrate, yes. So should the vast majority of people have any concerns about creatine safety? No. Can creatine improve people's responses to strength, power, and intermittent sprint exercise? Absolutely. Is creatine the only ergogenic aid behind Lympha Christie's success at the 1992 Olympics? Highly unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> Under certain conditions, can creatine improve some aspects of brain function? Yes, it can. But should everybody take creatine? There's no reason why they should. Without going into any details, what's the lowest dose of daily supplemental creatine you might recommend to somebody looking to use creatine? Healthy people, two to three grams. Clinical, 1.5 gram. And again, skipping the details, what's the highest dose of daily supplemental creatine that you might recommend to somebody, including clinical populations? 30 grams. Have you taken your creatine today? Yes, I have. <laughs> And is creatine currently overhyped? No. Says the man who's dedicated much of his career to studying creatine. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Thank you very much for your brief responses. You're surprisingly good at that for a scientist. I commend you. Oh, <laughs> I've had a little bit of a practice yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it might make sense to start with a brief description of what creatine is and where and how our bodies make it. Yeah, so it's it basically it's an organic acid. It, it's not an amino acid or protein, which a lot of people um, read about. It is through it, it's derived from three amino acids: arginine, glycine, and methionine. And it occurs in a basically in a two step process in the kidney and liver. And, and once it's produced in the liver, it simply diffuses into the bloodstream, and then it's carried to certain demanding cells. Uh, the majority of people are familiar with skeletal muscle, but it can also get into the bone and, as well as brain. Um, you can also get creatine through the diet. Uh, I, as I previously mentioned, small amounts in red meat and seafood and, and poultry will also have small amounts. Um, but then, uh, depending on your habitual dietary pattern, uh, maybe you're a vegan, you may have to consider uh, dietary supplementation. So those are the three areas that we can sort of get it in the body or have it in the body. Creatine likes to stay intact as opposed to being broken down into its constituent amino acids. Yeah, it's very unique. Um, you know, the, the pH of the stomach hovers between 1 to 2.5 pH. The creatine really degrades the most around 3 to 4. So ironically, the, the, the pH of the stomach is too low, and, and it sort of prevents the uh, crystallization of, of the molecule. And that's why I highly recommend uh, consuming creatine with uh, uh, water during the day. Um, and once it gets in uh, through the portal vein, uh, it doesn't go through first-pass metabolism like a lot of drugs do. It can get to the blood. and and our body recognizes it and it's taken up into the, into the cells. And that's probably why the safety profile is so good. Um, it's something our body recognizes, not only does it make it, but we consume it daily. And thinking about the body at large as opposed to any one tissue, how do you think we should think about what the creatine phosphate system does? Think of it as providing energy to our cells or for those exercising individuals, think of our muscle or those who have a really highly stressful job mentally, um, how it may improve uh, brain function and, and health. So some of the ways to look at it is maybe you can perform more exercise in the gym. Maybe you can run a little bit faster, maybe have less injuries. Uh, maybe you're less mentally fatigued, relying on a lot of coffee per day. Um, you know, these are some of the things that we theorize that creatine has been shown to have some, uh, some effects. And it's fair to say that this system is particularly important to uh, tissues that have very high energy needs, such as skeletal muscle, heart muscle, and the brain. Yeah, it, it's involved in any process where ATP is utilized, and that's all our cells. It was, it's got the majority of its press in the anaerobic energy system. So think of, you know, um, 
a high intensity weight training or, or some other types of sporting events. Um, but now it's actually have an application for endurance athletes, not only from maybe agility or balance or coordination, uh, but we also have to look at mental fatigue late in the fourth quarter, uh, the second half of a soccer game. Um, what about those students studying all night for an exam? Can that helpfully uh, relay? What about jet lag? So we'll talk about an abundance of things primarily uh, today with brain and bone and muscle, but it can have application and um, Obviously, there's implications potentially for pregnancy, which is out of my wheelhouse, but uh, it's sort of taken on a new life of its own where we've had this boring powder discovered in 1832 to 1835 and got really popular, as you mentioned, Linford Christie. And then um, we kind of thought we knew everything. And now it's sort of taken on a new uh, life of its own from a whole body total health perspective. And I wonder if you could just mention what we mean by it being both a, a temporal and a spatial energy buffer as well as its ability to right. quench hydrogen ions, just because those are obviously involved in muscle fatigue. The hydrogen ion area is, when you look at the basic chemical uh, equation, it's the area that never gets any love anymore. It used to. And, and so when you have a lot of hydrogen ions being produced, it sort of accumulates in the blood. And a lot of people have heard of lactic acid. Well, it's not really lactic acid. Lactate is really beneficial for the body, but those hydrogen ions can drop the pH of the blood. And and sort of give you that burning sensation or at least increase exercise fatigue. And when you have phosphocreatine combining with um, adenosine diphosphate, and it, it basically buffers a hydrogen ion. So temporal buffering is basically enabling ATP to be resynthesized immediately following each contraction, immediately following your sets, whichever it is. And that'll allow you to sort of expand these high energy uh, systems a little bit longer. And therefore, you may rely less on glycolysis to break down a carbohydrate or, of course, lipolysis to break down a fat. But when you're resting, you know, in between sets, whichever it is, and you're breathing oxygen, although creatine is usually touted as an anaerobic compound, its resynthesis is aerobic. And it's based on the shuttle system from the mitochondria into the, the other area of the cell we're referring to, the cytoplasm. This is sort of the area that contains a lot of fluid, but also other organelles. And every time you're breathing oxygen or resting in between sets, um, the longer you can go, you get more uh, natural synthesis um, or shuttling of creatine, uh, which is combined with ATP from the mitochondria. And therefore, it likes to go around areas of the cell that utilizes fossil creatine or ATP a lot. And one of the biggest is sodium, or sorry, uh, actinomycin or the crossbridge cycle. So it's really uh, in close proximity, allowing sort of muscle contraction to occur at a faster and more abrupt rate. Actinomycin being the primary cellular constituents that lead to muscle contraction, <laughs> if people aren't familiar with the terminology. That's correct. Sorry. It's primarily, those are the two, if you've heard of a sarcomere or the striated appearance of our muscle. Uh, we have all these little microscopic lines in our in our muscle fiber. Um, sort of if you cook a chicken breast or a steak and you look at those individual lines, it's no different than the human body. But inside those lines, there's a whole bunch of these proteins. The one we're most familiar with when we consider the rates of muscle protein synthesis are actinomycin. And they sort of act like an accordion. They pull over one another and, and sort of allow us to do a contraction. There's other proteins, troponin, tropomycin. We also have sarcoplasmic proteins and mitochondrial proteins. So, of course, there's a new theory now with uh, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, how that contributes to muscle growth. Uh, I speculate that creatine can be really implicated in cellular swelling, and that may help uh, promote sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Um, actinomycin has never been shown to increase or the rates of protein synthesis in healthy humans. They've shown that in chick embryo uh, cells or, or differentiating cells. Uh, but ironically, creatine has never been directly shown to increase the rates of protein synthesis. It probably does it by about 10 other factors that contribute to the translation of, of proteins. And we'll come back to some of the mechanisms behind why creatine supplementation mm -hmm. might help support muscle hypertrophy. But just staying right. with the effects of creatine on skeletal muscle function in the short yeah. term you touched there on the fact that when atp gets broken down into adp phosphocreatine can donate a phosphate group which helps buffer the decline in atp so clearly providing energy for high power 
short duration muscle actions is going to be one of the primary benefits of creating supplementation if it can boost phosphocreatine and total creatine in the muscle. Mm -hmm. So on that subject, I wonder if we could just focus on energy substrates and you could outline the effects of supplementation on the ATP phosphocreatine system, touching, for example, mm -hmm. on changes in muscle stores of creatine and phosphocreatine. Yeah, so in theory, the average individual's creatine storage capacity, just think of your muscle as a room, it's full to about 80%. Now, that is uh, influenced by your diet. Vegans are going to have a little bit less, and omnivores and carnivores are going to have more. But by supplementing with creatine short-term, or, or obviously the longer you go, you can probably increase it by about 20 to 40%, just depending on your habitual diet. So really, the, the creatine supplementation sort of tops up the tank in the muscle. And what does that mean to the energy systems? Well, that may delay or expand the anaerobic alactic system. So this is the system that they're all turned on all at once. But, you know, when you're immediately sprinting on a treadmill or whichever, your body doesn't have time to adjust between the aerobic system, the lactate four, the anaerobic alactic system. So the theory is that this enhances the highest energy capacity of the cell or the energy system. It may allow a few more seconds of work. It may allow a few more repetitions. That'll then obviously delay the recruitment or utilization in the anaerobic lactic system, which primarily will burn carbohydrate. Uh, that can be good because glycogen fatigue is one of the main causes of fatigue later on in exercise bouts, specifically for intermittent sports or longer duration. And, and of course, the last thing you want to do is sort of rely more on adipose tissue because it takes a long process. By the time those fatty acids get into the, you know, not only to the cell, they have to do fat CD36. They have to have fatty acid binding proteins and any carnitine to get into mitochondria. Then you have to go through the Krebs cycle. My God, by all those processes, we can't rely on that. Training will increase the efficiency of those processes and allow you to use more intramuscular triglycerides. But the overall goal is if you can enhance the anaerobic alactic system, that'll probably explain why individuals get bigger, stronger, faster uh, during short-term or explosive bouts of exercise. And I'll point out a couple of things. One is that type 2 muscle fibers are particularly mm -hmm. important to performance in these types of short-duration explosive activities, and they have higher phosphocreatine contents. And the other is that this ATP phosphocreatine system is particularly active in the first six seconds or so of maximal activity mm -hmm. to help put this in perspective in terms of say sports performance. So this system is integral to performance in things like running the hundred meters, throwing a shot put, throwing a javelin, but it's going to be relatively less important to someone running the 800 meters or running a marathon. But just to move on to some other considerations we focused there on short-term energy supply and before mm -hmm. we get to people's adaptations to training if supplementing with creatine could both boost the supply of these high energy phosphate groups and facilitate recovery then that could contribute to improved training adaptation so i wonder if we could just touch on some of the effects of creatine supplementation on recovery, both between sets, but also between bouts of exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some of the, the best elegant work early on was clearly shown that when you do repeated sets of an exercise, so for example, let's just say bench press, you may not notice a huge difference between placebo on the first set if you're doing repetitions to fatigue or a typical endurance, maybe eight to 12. But when you look at uh, sets two, three, and four, and you could also uh, lump in cardiovascular uh, types of time trial or spin performance, uh, this is where creatine really seems to aid in performance. It seems to speed up recovery, so you may not need to take as long between sets. So that's the first thing that could be important. Secondly, if it increases the fossil creatine system or uh, resynthesis of ATP after each set, that may allow quicker recovery, allowing you to actually do more repetitions in sets two, three, and four. So when you combine the amount of work you do per exercise, training volume typically can and may go up with a lot of individuals. Now, some studies show that there's no difference in training volume over a long period of time, but you still see noticeable increases or greater increases in strength, performance, and muscle mass. And that's probably due to to some of the mechanisms. But one of the biggest theories is that maybe creatine would allow the individual to recover between sets, definitely help speed up recovery between subsequent training sessions, 
And that could allow an individual to work uh, longer and more intensely in each session, allowing them to improve either on the field or in the gym, whichever it is. Do we know if there's any interaction between the degree to which creatine improves performance and the training volume of a given program? For example, has there been research comparing people's adaptations to low versus high volume resistance training? supplementing a standardized dose of creatine yeah. or placebo? It's an excellent question that it has. And all we've simply shown is that those individuals who seem to be the best responders to creatine from a muscle growth or performance perspective, uh, we've shown in young and olders, they seem to have a greater training volume perform over the study. But by equating the volume of training, that's a very interesting thought. You would speculate that the lower volume of training may not respond the same way. But you could also flip it. Maybe creatine could over um, compensate for the reduced volume of training. That could have huge implications for athletes during the tapering phase, during maybe prehabilitation from an injury. Could that help speed up or offset the detrimental effects of reduced volume training? So that's something that's not really been looked at, but it's an area of interest. For- It'll be interesting to compare two groups doing very different mm-hmm. volumes of training. For example, 30 sets per muscle group per week to 10 sets per muscle group per week with a creatine or a placebo condition. I would speculate the more you do, yeah, I I think I would agree. I I think I would speculate the more you do, I think you would get unlock more benefit from creatine. I I think it's there to really help uh, either during the the session, right after the set or subsequent training sessions. So if you had a group doing, you know, 30 sets per week of uh, just say uh, the elbow flexors versus 10, Creatine may augment the greater effect because you're doing more volume and that's sort of unlocking the potential. But again, the study needs to be done, but the theory is there for sure. So returning to what you briefly touched on earlier when discussing things like any potential anabolic or anti-catabolic effects of creatine Mm -hmm. supplementation, what are some other mechanisms by which creatine might facilitate recovery? And returning to what we were just discussing, we might think, for example, of whether creatine influences glycogen synthesis post-exercise and right. how that might have implications for training volume. Yeah, so the mechanisms from a, a specific recovery standpoint, there's a few, uh, as you just touched on, it has been shown to increase glycogen kinetics, uh, GLUT4 translocation to the muscle membrane. So that could allow more glucose in and that could speed up uh, glycogen synthase or the ability to synthesize glycogen. So, you know, glycogen fatigue is, is, is uh, it's an important factor to consider for intermittent sport or long duration sport or those on a low carb diet. So it can help. Uh, the other big one that never gets a lot of uh, press, so to speak, is calcium kinetics. So creatine will actually suck up or stimulate the sarcoplasm reticulum to take in calcium quicker. So therefore, the cycling of muscle relaxation is increased as well. Uh, caffeine opposes it. So that's why we can probably talk about maybe those two may not want to be taken at the same time. But the other area that we see more cellular data is the anti-catabolic effect. So creatine has been shown um, to reduce the number of inflammatory cytokines post-exercise, primarily aerobic, long duration, but it's also been shown to decrease in uh, markers of whole body protein breakdown. So it may have some anti-inflammatory or anti-catabolic effects. It may stimulate glycogen uh, and calcium kinetics, and it could allow an individual or at least a muscle to recover quicker to allow the individual to train more often and more frequent during a training program. Which is interesting because way to speak to a protein metabolism scientist, Luke Van Leeuwen, mm-hmm. Stu Phillips, somebody like that, then it's clear that the muscle protein synthesis side of the muscle protein balance equation is more amenable to change through dietary constituents like protein, the muscle protein breakdown is. Mm-hmm. And so in a way, creatine is affecting the side of the balance that's otherwise difficult to affect outside of very high concentrations of insulin and insulin-like growth factor. Yeah, so creatine is unique. It has both properties. We think there's way more uh, sort of anabolic potential properties, but it also uh, uh, has important anti-catabolic properties as well. Um, I think protein and creatine are very similar in line of the effects to the body. Um Creatine probably has a more multifactorial approach because a lot of people are interested in different uh, diseases and things like that. Um, But it can have some anabolic as well as anti-catabolic effects. So with that in mind, if we move on to performance and 
look at the history of creatine research, then we've known for some time mm -hmm. that creatine improves performance in various different activities, particularly repeated bouts of brief maximal efforts. Paul Green have did some work on this in the early 90s, looking specifically at, at repeated isokinetic muscle actions. But focusing mm -hmm. on strength and power and more recent research, can you give us an idea of the relative magnitude of performance improvements that we see when people supplement creatine and look at their performance in activities such as lifting weights, jumping and sprinting over the course of a training program. Yeah, yeah the, the magnitude, depending on if there's resistance training or not, can vary. Um, usually with resistance training, you might get, uh, specifically regarding strength, it's about a 12% greater increase, and now that'll fluctuate to lower or, or higher amounts, but on average, it's, it's a potential there. So it's well-versed to increase measures of muscle strength, endurance, power. It definitely has been now shown to improve uh, indices of agility, coordination in certain types of sports. Uh, jumping is one of the other ones uh, we, we look at from a power perspective. So from a muscle performance perspective, creatine is going to be right there with caffeine. It's been shown to really allow the muscle to perform either more work, get stronger, whichever it is. Uh, from a muscle growth perspective, we can talk about some of the mechanisms which we think are contributing. Uh, but by far, the most purported and unanimous uh, uh, sort of consensus of creatine is its ability to improve some aspects of muscle performance. And would you say looking across performance in lifting weights, jumping and sprinting, mm -hmm. we typically see changes of about five to 15%. You use the number 12% when discussing lifting weights specifically. Yeah, that's a, that's a good range. I think the people at the lower end are just starting out, will get the greater effect. It's no different than individuals with a lower amount of creatine starting out. And then people who've been training for a long period of time may only get that small effect to the ceiling. So I, I, I like that range, you know, five to 15%. It depends on the study and the, and the training status of the individual for sure. And just to pick up on a couple of other nuances, mm -hmm. you might expect that creatine would be more beneficial if the sprints are slightly longer. So if the sprints last, say, 20 seconds, as opposed to, mm -hmm. say, five seconds, in part just because it's easier to detect an effect statistically because more time has passed. And also thinking right. about power and power and activities where somebody has to physically move their mass. If creatine is causing an increase in body mass, then you might not see mm -hmm. relative power change that much, but absolute power might change substantially. And so you might expect, for instance, that creatine would be more beneficial for somebody like a lineman in American football or a shot putter, right. as opposed to a gymnast for whom maintaining a low body mass is really important. Yeah, and, and that's an excellent um, analogy because you're, you're totally right. It could have benefits for both. The longer the intermittent uh, exercise is, it's probably going to have more application for sports. But if body weight becomes an issue or the larger the frame is, it could slow the individual. That's something to consider. But we'll probably discuss, you know, when and does water retention or body weight go up? And if it does, does it ever subside? And that's something very interesting. Uh, and this typically, if it does, it might be during the acute loading phase. Uh, which we don't often promote anymore unless you're uh, a specific athlete needing it uh, that's where you can get some of the side effects the acute uh, net body water retention and weight gain but when you look at the totality of the studies over time it's ironic that body weight may not go up uh, across the board because you could have fluctuations in fat mass or your body's just adjusted to the water retention things like that so it is interesting and we will return to fluid retention for sure but just to spell out what a loading phase is it's a period typically of three to five days in which somebody consumes substantially more creatine than would be used for a maintenance dose yeah so uh, in general it's five to seven days for you can use an absolute amount 20 grams a day or we usually use 0 0.3 grams per kilogram so if you're 80 kilograms you're getting 24 grams a day but uh, ironically, after about three days, you're excreting a lot of that precious creatine you're ingesting. Um, so our muscle can probably tap out after about two or three days, and then you can substantially reduce it to a maintenance phase. Now, that's just from a skeletal muscle perspective. We have no idea about the optimal dose for brain or bone. Um, but a lot of people say, I don't like the loading phase. I can, is there another dose? And we can talk about dosing strategies for the average person to the athlete, uh, so on. Staying on the subject of body mass, obviously. Related to this is muscle hypertrophy. 
the increase in muscle size that takes place as people take creatine and undertake resistance training. And I know that you, you co-authored a meta-analysis last year looking at the effects of creatine supplementation on muscle hypertrophy. Tell us about the typical effects of supplementation on mass gains, including both the uh, loading yeah, phase so and, and long-term Yeah, so there's a big distinction. Most time, yeah, so most times there's a big distinction that um, we never measure muscle mass. There's hardly few labs that actually go in and look at, you know, cellular uh, uh, translation of proteins or, or uh, muscle fibers. So we typically measure lean mass. And from a gross surrogate estimate, 50% of the data is muscle, the rest is water or connective tissue and organs and things like that. So creatine has been shown to have a very small effect on uh, muscle uh, growth. It does go up, but the growth or the amount is probably a lot smaller because we actually don't have a lot of data to look at dry muscle mass over time. On average, you can look at anywhere between one to three kilograms of lean mass. And if you accept that as 50%, okay, we'll take a few pounds of muscle mass over time. Obviously, the longer you go, you're going to get more dry muscle mass accretion over time. We think if you're noticing an increase in lean mass by DEXA or BIA over the first few weeks, even to a month, it's primarily water retention. So that uh, uh, warrants a bit of caution. So these are the things to, to go hand in hand. That muscle performance is usually uh, a sound increase. Lean tissue mass usually will go up as well. Uh, it has been shown in young females. Uh, to go up compared to uh, young males, but not to the same degree. And that's the same analogy we've seen with older males versus uh, older females. Uh, they do respond, but the growth seems to be blunted in females, biological females. That may have to do with the cessation of estrogen. Uh, females just don't seem to be uh, inhibiting uh, protein breakdown as much. Uh, and the other big one is we think females might have a little bit more creatine in their muscles to start with. So they have a little bit less room uh, to grow or respawn. Uh, and that's some of the analogies why we think there might be a very small, if any, biological sex difference. That's interesting because my understanding is that even though you might not see as pronounced changes in muscle mass, muscle thickness, and so on in females as in males, you still see the improvements in performance. And the difference in the magnitude of the performance between males and females is is probably not significant. That's correct. The performance gains are uh, are very very uh, proven in young and, and older females. And actually, the if you look at the relative change, sometimes female studies show a greater response. Uh, they may have started a little bit lower, so they had a greater room to change. So again, both biological males and females respond very well to creatine from a muscle growth and uh, performance perspective. But the growth is sort of a blunted from our meta-analysis in lean tissue mass uh, the performance. Uh, I did a, a paper with Abby Smith-Ryan, and we've looked at power, endurance, performance, and strength, and uh, clearly shown that multiple studies, not just a few, uh, clearly show that uh, females respond very favorably to creatine supplementation. So how would you explain the fact that they're not getting the same gains in muscle mass, but they are getting the performance improvements? That suggests that it's maybe not the muscle tissue per se, absent any changes in, say, myosin heavy chain composition, but as something more to do with the yeah. central nervous system. 100%. So the neurophysiological system, we don't think there's any differences between the axon and neuromuscular junction or the recruitment of the, the muscle. Now, you might speculate, well, we don't know the difference between um, muscle fiber biology. There's been a few papers just recently that have shown that males may have more uh, muscle fibers per cross-sectional area. Um, but we theorize regarding the differences in muscle growth, uh, going back to what I, I sort of alluded to, females might have a little bit more creatine uh, initially because they might in general have smaller muscle mass. So the concentration could be a little bit higher. Uh, there's been a few studies now showing that uh, females for some reason do not experience a decrease in measures of protein breakdown to the same degree as males. So they may, may, may not be able to recover the muscle um, as well. And then the, the other one is we don't really know uh, the effects of estrogen, although estrogen is very anabolic, especially during the uh, premenopausal years. What about postmenopause? Uh, we don't think the androgen or the adrenal cortex can produce enough estrogen to override what the ovaries are not producing. So those are the three areas that we're um, uh, discussing, so to speak, uh, but a lot more biological mechanisms need to, to be there as well. I speculate the biggest reason is the huge uh, um, fluctuation at the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, you know, mm. 
for okay. muscle to uh, contract, obviously calcium has to be released. And the faster you can recycle that calcium leaving troponin back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, getting ready for the next release, that's where creatine has been shown to be effective. So one of the main purported mechanisms why creatine increases strength is the uh, influence it has on calcium kinetics. And I don't speculate there's any difference between biological females or males there. Uh, that's one of the areas. Uh, the other areas we see some uh, good evidence with insulin-like growth factor, but again, regarding strength, it seems to be more neurophysiologically uh, uh, related there as well. If women don't see any substantial increases in hypertrophy in response to creatine supplementation in conjunction with the resistance training, does that mean that they also don't experience an increase in muscle glycogen the way that males do? Because if there was that increase in muscle glycogen, then given that that increases the total amount of water in the muscle and so on, one would expect that that alone would increase fat-free mass. Yeah, no, that's uh, that would be speculation. Yeah, there's no biological difference between uh, uh, glycogen or intramuscular triglyceride synthesis or, or, or anything like that. So again, that would, could be one of the things, you know, maybe if you are getting an increase in glycogen, which stores basically for every gram is about three grams of water, could that be increasing the amount of lean mass measured by the the DEXA or BIA, that could be. And that's why we're really cautious. If you're measuring lean mass, we're not really exactly sure where the lean mass is coming from. Um, and that's why it's usually correlated with biopsies to cross validate cross sectional area, or at least an MRI. Um, but those are the limitations currently uh, with the body of research on creatine. The measures when we say we put on muscle mass, I like to correct people say, no, you put on lean mass. You can use muscle ultrasound but now we're down to measuring centimeters of growth over time. And there's some limitations with ultrasound as well. Uh, just like any technique you're using, you would basically have to do an autopsy pre post, take the muscle out, but we can't do that in a free living human. So that's why we're always limited in our expectations with it over time. I just want to think about the effects of creating supplementation relative to some other potential ergogenic aids. So we spoke briefly about protein earlier, for instance, and thinking about older mm -hmm. adults, and just cycling back to what we were discussing earlier in your meta-analysis, you found that the responses in younger adults might be slightly stronger than the responses in older mm -hmm. adults who might not gain as much fat-free mass in relative terms compared to the younger counterparts. But when we look at some of the literature on ergogenic aids for older adults, let's say that they are 65 years old or older, then many recent reviews have put forward using leucine supplementation or spiking the diet with mm -hmm. leucine as a way to increase the fat-free mass of these people, given their relative anabolic resistance to the muscle building effects of amino acids. And I've read some mm -hmm. of those articles suggesting that leucine has the strongest evidence in its favor, even though my impression is that looking at the literature at large, creatine is relatively more anabolic than L-leucine is. How do you think the effects of creatine on skeletal muscle compared to some of these other ergogenic aids? And also more on the subject, given that it might not be that creatine is stimulating muscle protein synthesis substantially, would we expect there to be additive effects of creatine supplementation in conjunction with essential amino acids or complete proteins? Yeah, th that's a, a really interesting uh, point. So there's been a, a couple studies where they've looked at the combination of creatine and whey protein and, and shown to have some uh, greater beneficial effects. And my thought is if you compare creatine to leucine, I would probably favor creatine from the multifactorial effects it can have to the older body, not just from a muscle perspective, but maybe bone and cognition as well. Um, the leucine is there. And then there's been a few studies where they've spiked you know, adequate protein with leucine and you didn't get any greater effect. And I've done a, a paper with Hamilton Rochelle from uh, Brazil, and we've shown that, you know, if older adults are getting about eight or nine grams of pro or a leucine a day, that seems to be really good for uh, muscle growth and performance perspectives. Um, and is it hard for older adults to get the total daily amount of protein? It probably is. Um, I think Luke and, and Stu and Lee Breen and, and people like that would say, we're not really sure the optimal dose right now. I know uh, most will recommend 1.2, maybe 1.6 for older adults. I, I do like uh, the Morton meta-analysis. You know, 2.2 has been shown to be that confidence interval. So it depends on the person, if they have a metabolic disease, 
Uh, but definitely the RDA for protein is way too low. It's, it's almost embarrassing because uh, it could lead to a lot of caxia and sarcopenia. But um, comparing a study of whey protein and creatine or another protein versus uh, protein and leucine would be very interesting. Um, but the interesting thing is a lot of times when we look at food first, which we usually emphasize, you know, creatine and protein are typically found in red meat or seafood. Um, those are things we'd ideally want to emphasize first, especially to an older adult, because they're going to get a lot more vitamins and minerals and, and other macronutrients. But if you have to rely on a supplement, um, you know, there's only a few that seem to be um, effective from a multifactorial perspective. Protein and creatine seem to be on the ILC, uh, ILC's list. There's beta alanine and bicarbonate and beetroot juice, and there's not a lot. Um, so that means 99% of the stuff you see in the supermarket or store maybe doesn't have the best evidence to put all your money into it. Um, but that's ironic. There's a handful of things that seem to be consistent for the type of exercise you're doing. Leucine tends to reduce food intake, if anything. And one issue that a lot of older people face is that they just don't eat enough. And given that leucine right. and some of the other amino acids tend to promote satiety and reduce total daily energy intake, whereas as far as I know, that's not the case for creatine monohydrate. That to me is a green flag for creatine relative to leucine. Yeah, like the, the leucine will start the mTOR pathway. It'll sort of, you know, warm it up, but you still need the other eight in there and they're only coming from the diet. So even if you're lacking the other ones from the diet, uh, the individual may not get functional uh, proper proteins over time. We're sort of creatine sort of acts, as you just said, in different ways. And maybe that's why it might be uh, something to consider at least. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a helpful analogy is that if you imagine a construction worker building a wall using <laughs> bricks, then leucine is like bringing the construction worker along to the wall. But the worker needs more bricks to lay on top of each other. And those bricks come in the form of other okay. amino acids. So a leucine in isolation yeah. can be helpful when it's added to a diet that contains the other amino acids. But if you're going to take it on an empty stomach That's in true. isolation, then it's going to trigger muscle protein yeah. synthesis, but there's going to be nothing to synthesize. Yeah, it's, it's probably no different than the hype around branch chain amino acids. Now you only have three of the nine, you still got to get the other six. And that's probably why at the end of the day, a complete protein is going to be superior to any individual, even an individual essential amino acid. If we transition now to bone, then before we get to any clinical mm -hmm. studies on bone health and fracture risk, what do you think are some of the direct and indirect pathways through which creatine might affect bone health and the integrity of bones? Yeah, so we think it really influences the bone remodeling or bone uh, turnover process. So there was a cellular study that showed that creatine can increase the differentiation or activity, if you will, of osteoblast cells. So osteoblasts are our anabolic cells for bone. They sort of uh, take calcium and phosphates and deposit it more into the bone matrix. Uh, but the vast majority of evidence suggests that creatine, just like we talked about the anti-catabolic effects of the muscle, it seems to have a, a, a lot more evidence showing it has anti-catabolic effects to bone. And the theory is it can sort of decrease markers of bone breakdown. These are your osteoclast cells. So when you think of bone, um, breaking down, if we can sort of decrease that accelerated rate and maybe increase the synthesis, that might help explain why we're seeing some potential favorable effects on bone, primarily in older adults, uh, either by maintaining bone integrity or even potentially having very small improvements in bone matrix. Now, keep in mind, older adults are losing muscle, losing bone. If we can come up with a dietary or lifestyle intervention to at least maintain or potentially even increase it, has huge clinical applications for offsetting osteoporosis or potential fracture risk later on in life. So those are some of the direct effects and obviously some of the indirect ones might be that if somebody is able to withstand larger activity loads and training loads, then that's providing a stronger stimulus for bone remodeling. Going back to Wolf's law, bone adapts in response to the mechanical loads that are placed on it. And both the magnitude and the rate of loading are important. So if you want to build more right. dense functional bones, then you want activities with high forces and with high yeah. rate of and force that's changes. The, that's the big indirect one for sure. Yeah. yeah. 
it's our big it, so the muscle bone interaction the theories if you have more muscle throughout the day pulling on bone you're going to get a greater uh, bone stimuli so those are the indirect and, and direct um mechanisms we've shown that markers of bone breakdown NTL peptides or a marker of collagen breakdown has been significantly reduced in the presence of creatine but all of this with bone is in combination with weight training so this is a bit interesting in, in you can get muscle benefits without uh resistance training but we're only actually seeing favorable effects from creatine on bone when they're in com combination with resistance training so tell us a bit about the work that you published last year that looked at markers of bone health in postmenopausal women. Yeah, it was a, it was a daunting clinical trial. Uh, we decided we've done some pilot data showing that um, creatine for a year and about eight to ten grams, so a little bit higher than normal, uh, decreased the rate of bone mineral loss in the hip region. Uh, but unfortunately, it was uh, what we consider underpowered. It was in a small population in, in postmenopausal females. And colleagues in Brazil, Bruno Gualiano and Hampton Rochelle, have shown now repeatedly that one to three grams of creatine without exercise for up to two years had no effect on bone. So we thought, okay, resistance training seems to need to be there. And then let's do a higher dose of creatine for the potential uh, anabolic and anti-catabolic effects. And uh, we did publish it last year in Medicine and Science and Sports Exercise. So we gave uh, 0.15 grams of creatine, roughly, or about 11 grams a day for two straight years. So this is about three to four times more than what's recommended for bone or muscle. Uh, we gave about 11 grams a day to postmenopausal females. The average age was 57 years of age uh, for two straight years. And they had to perform uh, weight training for three days a week and brisk walking six days a week. And after two years, some of the big uh, take home messages, there was no greater adverse effects on liver or kidney compared to placebo. So we're really confident now that creatine is very safe um, because we gave such a high dose for such a long period of time. It did improve markers of gait performance or walking ability. It, creatine did improve uh, measures of lean tissue mass. But the big take home is that it actually preserved bone geometry around the hip. So it seemed to preserve or decrease the rate of bone mineral loss compared to those on placebo. So in theory, what this could mean is it may help maintain the integrity of the skeleton as these uh, females get older in life. If they were to fall, could this decrease the rate of fracture? We don't know because we didn't measure that, but the theory is there if the bone is maintained uh, and got a bit stronger. So those were the big take-homes there that we, we did see, yeah. In that particular study, you didn't find that creatine affected any functional measures. So for example, muscle strength, it did affect walking time over 80 meters. And that makes me wonder about what right. the training program was and whether the training provided mm -hmm. an appropriate stimulus, because had the stimulus been different, then were it sufficient to result in changes between the groups in response to the creatine supplementation, then that might have loaded bone differently and led to more yes. changes in the different measures of bone that you looked at, given that you didn't find changes in, in some of the measures. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was the biggest surprise to me. I thought that was the one we would see the, the greatest differentiation. And uh, we measured hack squat, leg press, and of course, chest press. Uh, we picked those measures because they hit the, the majority of the muscles in the lower and upper body. And uh, both groups substantially improved. So the nice thing there is that resistance training is very effective for improving strength in, in older individuals. The coefficient of variation, especially for the hack squat, is very high. Mm. So the variability um, uh, was high. That might have washed out any of the small effects between the groups. It was a whole body routine. Um, and that was, we tried to just do something applicable that a, a postmenopausal female may do. And again, could maybe the results might have been different in younger females or doing a lot more free weight. This was machine based. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's uh, to, to be investigated. But we, we speculate that the, the overall uh, program was effective and maybe the smaller, greater effects we're creating were just un, uh, unable to be detected. And kudos to you for doing that study, because I imagine that that kind of study, <laughs> which is so long involving so many people, is very, very hard yeah. to carry out and bone turns over slowly. It's not yeah. like skeletal muscle. And so yes. you need yeah, large we, numbers and we, long it, periods it, to realize any differences between groups. 
yeah, it, it took a decade to, from start to finish. Uh, we were hoping to use more uh, sensitive measures of bone with uh, PQCT, uh, but we went with DEXA and uh, bone ultrasound. Uh, we started in 2013 and then we finally published it. So when all said and done, it took a decade and a lot of money. Uh, it was very expensive. Mm. Yep. And I've heard you say that you think that female bone might respond slightly better to creatine the male bone when used in conjunction with appropriate training. Why do you think that is? And what's the evidence behind that? Is this a question of there just being more scope to improve metrics such as bone mineral density, given that especially post-menopause, most women are going to lose more of their bone mass and density? Yeah, I think that you've hit the nail on the head there. Probably starting with lower bone density, it's already more catabolic with the aging process. So they actually may respond to a greater rate. In other words, if it is the osteoblast or osteoclast cells responding, that might help preserve. So when you compare it to a group that's not getting it, the expectation is maybe the postmenopausal females would have more of a detriment compared to a preservation in the creatine group. Sometimes we see beneficial effects in older, healthy males, uh, but we um, speculate that if we don't, the skeleton was already healthy enough and it didn't sort of need the extra benefit from creatine. And am I right in thinking that in that particular study, you also gave people calcium and vitamin D? Yes, we did. We, each group was getting uh, calcium and vitamin D per day. So we uh, made sure we adhered to the osteoporosis uh, guidelines in Canada. So because what you don't want is one group having a reduction in vitamin D and calcium. And obviously those are the two pre precursors for the matrix or the, um, the lattice working of the skeleton. Um, so therefore we helped, we equated that. There was no differences in diet over time. So any change we think could be due to the intervention. And how do you think the results might have differed had you not had people supplement calcium and vitamin D at the same time? Do you think that the effects of creatine on bone might have been smaller or larger? I would probably speculate they would be smaller because now you're taking away two potentially preservation or anabolic uh, entities. Of course, we know the effects of vitamin D, especially of individuals deficient or calcium. Um, but they would probably be lower because now you had to rescue the effects of not having adequate amounts if the person was deficient. Uh, most weren't, but we were making sure we had uh, adhere to the recommended guidelines. So again, that's an interesting thought um, because there are individuals out there that may not consume any dairy or any supplements. Could this have a rescuing effect? It'd be very interesting. Yeah. And how do you think creatine compares to other purportedly bone building supplements? Obviously, there are lots of these on the market nowadays, everything from boron to vitamins d and k2 yeah. and all of these different supplements yeah at the end of the day creatine has a very very small effect to the skeleton where we're actually not seeing any improvement in bone mineral density and at best it can sort of preserve the geometry of the skeleton in certain populations we have no idea the effect of young uh, individuals that are you know uh, uh between the ages of 18 to, to 40 um, that has to be looked at, uh, obviously, when uh, estrogen is plentiful and what are the effects of osteoporotic females. So as it currently stands, creatine has a very small favorable effect, uh, but only when it's combined with exercise. Just staying on the subject of fat-free mass a while longer, if we look at what happens during disuse mm -hmm. atrophy that accompanies injury, then there are various reasons to think that taking creatine at this time might be helpful. So during disuse, there is reduced intracellular phosphate, reduced mm -hmm. glycogen, reduced content of the transporters for creatine, and there's loss of bone mass. And so given all of those changes, one might think that creatine could potentially attenuate some of these changes. And obviously creatine can help with reconditioning following injury when somebody actually starts loading the region once more. But what do you think mm -hmm. about any effects of creatine on the musculoskeletal system during disuse atrophy itself? Yeah, so there's been a few studies. We were fortunate to, to sort of publish one where we got volunteers, young uh, university students, to volunteer to have a plaster cast put on uh, their limb. And it was actually shown to reduce the rate of muscle and strength loss once the cast came off. And as you alluded to, uh, Peter Hespel did a fantastic study during rehabilitation from uh, bed rest or uh, immobilization and creatine sort of increase some transcription factors. So there's something there. There's some lines of evidence to suggest that when the muscle is not activated, 
Creatine may preserve uh, the integrity of the muscle somehow. We're not exactly sure why that would be, but could it be due to the anti-inflammatory or anti-catabolic effect? Um, going to the protein research now, it's been shown that uh, the reason you have muscle loss with immobilization is not so much what we thought it was higher protein breakdown, it's just a decrease in synthesis. And if creatine doesn't increase synthesis, it must work in another way. So again, it's very speculative, uh, but there is some lines of evidence it could. So if an athlete was to break their arm and put a plaster cast on their right arm, could taking creatine offset the rate of loss? There is a few studies that have shown it could. Um, would they get a better effect if they did cross-education training and trained the left arm? That's a study that I've worked with or talked to a colleague at another university about uh, by fracturing or immobilizing the limb, uh, training the healthy side with creatine, could that cause a greater cross-education effect? Uh, it remains to be determined. Yeah. Can I throw a research idea in the mix? Yes, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> Here, what we're talking about is training the contralateral limb. So if you injured your left knee mm -hmm. and your left knee was in a cast, then you would carry on training your right leg. And the evidence suggests that if you do that appropriately, mm -hmm. then you'll help retain strength in the injured limb. However, my understanding is that that is largely due to central effects of training the contralateral limb. By central, I mean within the nervous system. And there are some <laughs> other ways that might help preserve mass in the injured limb. One of them being changes in blood flow and interventions such as blood flow restriction of the injured limb absent any exercise. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about maybe using that as an intervention, just given that that's less likely to be affecting the central nervous system and maybe more likely to be affecting the muscle tissue itself? Yeah, I had discussions with Jeremy Lanneke about this as well, trying to get an adequately powered study with blood flow restriction and creatine. I believe there was a study last year published, and it makes sense that uh, it could accelerate the rate of cross-education. Um, but again, it needs to be looked at, but there's potential there and, and very interesting as well. Yeah. Okay. And then we've spoken a bit about muscle tissue and bone tissue as well. The other tissue compartment that people are interested in when thinking about body composition is, of course, their adipose tissue, their fat mass. And mm -hmm. I know that you've been on a hot streak of meta-analyses and published another meta-analysis recently <laughs> looking at the effects of creating supplementation on fat mass. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, so we did two. We've looked at individuals 49 years of age and younger. And then, of course, we did 50 and above looking at the effects. And the, the, the results were if you, we sort of, uh, for inclusion criteria, they had to perform resistance training and or take creatine or placebo. And uh, a little bit surprising that the, the results were mirror images, that when you combine creatine and resistance training, you get a very small reduction in body fat, maybe 1% to 2%. Um, it was significant, but again, the question is, is that practically significant? Uh, absolute fat mass did decrease in both young and older individuals, but it was not significant. So on average, maybe a pound or so over time. So at the end of it, I think the best way to conclude is that for those that are cautious or a little scared of taking creatine to put on body fat, we don't see that. If anything, we see no effect of creatine, and you could argue you get a small decrease in, in fat mass. The theory is that maybe creatine by stimulating muscle mass is increasing resting and exercise metabolic rate. Uh, there's some uh, animal data and cellular data to suggest that creatine increases thermal uh, genesis and energy expenditure. And then there's a speculation that it has been shown to have some favorable effects on mitochondrial biogenesis or the organelle that will oxidize the fatty acids. So when you combine all three of those, I think some of the favorable effects of creatine on fat mass maybe direct or indirect, but at the end of the day, I think viewers uh, could be rest assured you're probably not going to increase fat mass. If you do put on uh, a weight or a number on the scale, hopefully it's muscle. It may be a little bit of water, but I, I don't think it's going to be fat mass. Two related questions. When you say mitochondrial biogenesis, which tissue compartment are you referring to? And when thinking about thermogenesis, I know there was this very high profile publication in nature relatively recently suggesting that creatine had some thermogenetic effects but if it does increase thermogenesis then do you think that it does so corrected for fat free mass so do you think that it's actually increasing energy expenditure relative to fat free mass 
Well, that's a really good question, and, and I don't have an answer for it, but it would be logical that obviously the greater the amount of lean tissue or muscle mass you have, that could increase energy expenditure. Although at the end of the day, your resting energy expenditure doesn't usually go up that much from having more muscle mass. It's the ability to utilize those calories over time, which uh, might be a bit surprising for those watching. Um, but at the end of the day, if it does influence the mitochondria, or speed up the ability to utilize maybe more adipose tissue that could be contributing. And everybody should be trying to target more adipose tissue, including intramuscular triglycerides, because that could delay um, glycogen um, depletion, which could allow the individual to exercise a little bit longer and speed up body or improve body composition more. And is the mitochondrial biogenesis in adipose tissue? We speak about adipocyte browning here, or are we talking about skeletal muscle exclusively? My understanding it was in skeletal muscle, but it was in the rodent model. And again, it hasn't been replicated in humans. So I want to move back to exercise now and speak a little bit about endurance mm -hmm. exercise. You spoke very early on about the fact that creatine can affect mitochondrial function. And obviously ATP provision during longer exercise, let's say that's exercise lasting over two minutes, is provided more by aerobic metabolism than anaerobic. So we might not expect substantial effects of creatine supplementation on performance in these types of events, but some people have theorized that creatine could benefit endurance in certain activities through a few mechanisms by increasing muscle glycogen, by enhancing that shuttling of ATP mm -hmm. from mitochondria that you spoke about. And some people think that it might affect variables such as anaerobic or ventilatory threshold as well. Can you tell mm -hmm. us about what your thoughts are on whether creatine might benefit endurance and also whether in some instances it could actually be detrimental to performance and endurance activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if it can have a benefit, I think it, it's very specific to the sport or activity you're doing. So we've already talked about how creatine can increase high energy phosphate metabolism. So any type of sport that utilizes really explosive bursts of energy, uh, sprinting, um, uh, running, swimming, uh, whichever it is, creatine can help aid there as well. Um, but research is mixed. You'll get a lot of studies that support it and, and, and some don't. The longer the duration goes, we don't really see huge benefits from creatine, if any, but it may help improve recovery from long duration exercise. So it really comes down to the context of the sport. It's If it's more anaerobic or intermittent, you're probably going to see a greater benefit, maybe from glycogen, calcium, or that high energy phosphate metabolism. The sports we don't speculate that creatine would have an effect or maybe a detrimental effect is when it's really involved in acuteness to weight and or the longer duration it goes. So, for example, if you make a mistake and take your creatine and you're doing the uh, loading phase for too long or you do respond very well and put on maybe just say three kilograms of, of water or mass, which is very rare, that could have detrimental effects to a body weight or um, relative type of sport. So. There's some type of sports that it may not be beneficial for. Um, but again, there's the majority of evidence is suggesting it can have some favorable effects. One thing to point out is that quite a few studies will use indoor cycling ergometry to look at endurance. And if you're cycling on a stationary bike, then your body mass is less of a factor than if you're cycling on a road, for yes. example. <laughs> And then thinking about some of the other determinants of endurance performance, I know a lot of people have looked at VO2 max and there was a meta-analysis by some French scientists suggesting that it might have a very small negative effect. But again, much of the time, VO2 mass is expressed in relative terms as opposed to absolute ones. And I think if anything, if creatine is going to positively affect performance and endurance exercise, then it might be under specific conditions. You spoke about the osmotic effects of creatine. And obviously that can be helpful when it comes to hydration. So do you think that it could be that creating supplementation could be beneficial during, for example, performance in the heat or very humid conditions? Yeah, I actually think it's one of the most important benefits of it. We put out a, a, a position stand sort of uh, paper a few years ago, with the myths and misconceptions of creatine and hydration was because one of the things we hear often about, oh, I suffer or muscle cramps and strains and when you look at the osmotic effect of creatine coming in, allowing more potential intracellular water uh, retention, of course, it drags in sodium for the sodium potassium pump. The theory is it actually hyperhydrates the, the cell and therefore the individual should experience less muscle cramping and, and strain. So I think it actually hyperhydrates 
Uh, so it has the opposite effect of dehydrating. And I think that's one of the biggest myths or misconceptions out there with creatine. So it could be that it's most likely to be beneficial when body mass isn't so important, when muscle damage is very high, when sweat rates are very high, and when people are short on sleep. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned short on sleep as a segue to what I'd like to discuss next. But yes. Based on what I was just saying, the types of athletes that come to mind are certain ultra endurance athletes. And I've done some work previously with ocean rowers, for instance, who actually benefit from being relatively heavy and they have horrible schedules of insufficient sleep, enormous yes. volumes of exercise. And while desperately trying to keep their food down, it is not a job that I would sign up for, but I've got a massive amount of respect for them. 